Dick. Let's go. Stay on the sidewalk. Keep on the sidewalk, guys. I have a great drive to cover news, and I've had it all my life from the time I was about eight or nine years old when I wanted to be a newspaper man. His career has spanned five decades. He's covered 11 presidents, nine governors, eight mayors, and two John Glenn parades 30 years apart. In 54 years, he has scarcely missed a beat, passed up a story, or neglected to ask the tough question. How about this uh, indictment, Mr. Genovese? He is absolutely innocent. The Pressman Ryan Report, a comprehensive 25-minute wrap-up of the top news of New York and the metropolitan area. As the first street reporter to anchor a local TV newscast, he was a pioneer, a daily guest in the homes and apartments of his fellow New Yorkers. It was a brief, bitter clash between police and pickets. The man is credited with inventing street reporting. His in-your-face style has been copied by colleagues and competitors alike. What is your name? What is your name? It's a violation of penal law to assault sewer newsman in this, in this city. Driven by his dogged passion for uncovering injustice, he has reported on the young and the old, the rich and famous, the disadvantaged. And for this next hour, we'll take a look at his story. This is an NBC4 special presentation to Gabe Pressman for a life in the news. Many happy returns. The Bronx of the Roaring Twenties was made tough by the Europeans who flocked there and the industry that pockmarked the landscape. Here, Gabriel Stanley Pressman was born on Valentine's Day, 1924. My mother uh, was what we used to call a housewife who had a great burning desire for education. Family lore says that Lena Pressman stood outside the religious schoolroom listening to the lessons because women were not allowed inside. She passed along that passion for learning to her son. Mother was very uh, interested in uh, helping me uh, do well in school. And I remember when I was in the seventh grade, she devised some flashcards to teach me the parts of speech and other uh, grammatical issues, uh, which uh, lasted me for a long time. His father, Benjamin Pressman, was a dentist who really wanted to be a magician. He didn't like dentistry, but he loved magic. A quiet man, his face would light up when he performed his various tricks. He went around doing magic for the neighborhood kids. And then he became Dr. Magic in his later years, he did shows in the public schools, and uh, he did, did it for nothing. As a young boy, Gabe was fascinated by newspapers. He would watch the trucks drop off the afternoon papers every half hour at the candy store. It wasn't long before he got into the business. When I was about um, eight or nine years old, I put out a family newspaper called The Hot News, and the O in hot was in the shape of a sun, and it had rays coming out of it. And I would uh, produce this newspaper, uh, you know, with headlines like Cousin uh, Teddy Cuts uh, First Tooth or Grandma Bakes Sponge Cake. She uses real sponges. After stints as an editor of his high school literary magazine and the school newspaper at New York University, Gabe joined the Navy at the height of World War II. Ensign Pressman was green and inexperienced. I served in the Pacific on a small vessel, a submarine chaser. There were 60 enlisted men and five officers. I was one of the five. On my first night aboard, I fell off the ship. The captain said, why don't you guys, meaning me and the other officers, go out and see a flick. The ship was tied up to the dock at Pearl Harbor. I requested permission to leave the ship, saluted the flag, and walked off between the ship and the dock. After the war, Gabe earned his master's degree at Columbia University School of Journalism. Then it was on to the New York World Telegram, covering crime and politics. In 1954, he began his broadcasting career at WRCA Radio. Nobody knew exactly what a reporter would do in New York. And so at first I was running around with a tape recorder, picking up sounds and interviews for radio. Then came television. And I tried to go out and cover things as I did as a newspaper man, figuring it was one and the same. 
we had to break down barriers. For example, they wouldn't let us into the city council. And uh, I made a big scene w one day, and I was thrown out by the sergeant at arms. And ultimately, uh, this resulted in the council being open to cameras. Some of the m newspaper guys didn't want me to be covering uh, Mayor Wagner with a camera. They felt, they said, we're not actors. We don't want to be actors on what you're doing. And uh, Wagner said, look, uh, Gabe covered me when he was a newspaper man working for the World Telegram. Now he's got a camera. Uh, this place is open to him, too. Well, uh, Gabe knew you. We'll have a caucus uh, on Monday. Harry Truman was the first president Gabe covered. Truman was out of office, but he made frequent trips to New York to visit his daughter Margaret and his grandchildren. Truman would stay at the Carlisle Hotel, where every morning he'd begin his day with his traditional walk. Every morning at 7.20, he would meet me and Joe Schroeder of the AP, and occasionally somebody else, and we'd take this brisk walk in which he would comment on everything under the sun. He loved this walk. What do you think of this gadget we've got covering you today? That's a dandy. Uh, I don't think that our fellow who's holding the camera is having a very comfortable ride. <laughs> I hope he's enjoying it. I am. Gabe Pressman has always enjoyed his work. And there's never been a story too big or too small that Gabe hasn't reported. Mayor Wagner and Mrs. Wagner flew out today for a week or ten day vacation in the Bahamas. Mrs. Wagner was wearing her Easter bonnet for the trip. The hat was pale blue and adorned with a wide band of white tulle and they headed for Nassau and a holiday in the sun. This is the uh, doorway to the grand jury room here at the Bronx County Courthouse on the eighth floor. What's going on in the metropolitan area tonight? At Lewison Stadium, Joseph Rosenstock conducts a program of Strauss, Stravinsky, and Tchaikovsky. Motorists along the shores of the Hudson might have been forgiven at midday if they rubbed their eyes in disbelief. The dinosaurs were constructed of fiberglass in Hudson, New York, and were headed for the Sinclair Dinoland exhibit, which will cover an acre at the New York World's Fair. Robert Moses, the embattled president of the World's Fair. Would you say that uh, some of your critics have uh, likened you to that kind of prehistoric monster? Well, I think he looks a little bit like some of the newspaper men <laughs> I see around. <laughs> In the melting pot called New York, there's a little slice of the mysterious Orient down on Elizabeth Street named the Kiki Cake Company. At work here is the city's fortune cookie, Tycoon. Our particular fortune came in a giant-sized cookie, and it says, oh, yes, it says you have precisely five seconds to end this story if you don't want to get cut off the air. Cutting Gabe off is not an easy thing to do. Here at the Hilton Hotel, a member of the Economic Club of New York attempted to prevent him from interviewing a minister of Quebec. Gabe didn't take it lying down. He was tripped. What is your name? What is your name? It's a violation of a penal law to a Saul Sewer newsman in this, in this city, yes. Parades are a New York tradition. Columbus Day, St. Patrick's Day, Thanksgiving. Motorcades winding through the Canyon of Heroes in a snowstorm of ticker tape. Floats, balloons, bands, politicians, crowds, and sometimes a cardinal. Oh, Ireland, isn't it grand you look? The poet John Locke wrote, and sure, it was a grand and a proud day for the Irish of New York, and especially for one Philadelphia-born Irishman who was the Grand Marshal. How do you think your father would look at this honor? <laughs> As I told the people in the cathedral, the, I'm not sure my mother and father, who are long since in heaven, ever thought that I would amount to anything and certainly, I don't think they were particularly impressed when I became the Archbishop of New York. But now they're finally impressed. Another year, another parade. And many of the grown-ups who are here today with their children came here as children themselves many years ago. And many will be back next year. For this is tradition. This is New York. Gabe Pressman, NBC News. If I am the big man that I am, I go maybe to Gabe and say, Gabe. If you can help that person, remember, my name is Joe Colombo, and you better do it. Another New York tradition has been gangland crime. And when warring families took their differences to the streets, it made headlines. Gay was on the scene shortly after Joe Colombo took three slugs point blank at a rally in Columbus Circle. One of the greatest rub outs in underworld history occurred in 1957, when crime boss Albert Anastasia was murdered as he got a shave in the barber shop at the Park Sheridan. 
It didn't take long for Gabe to get to the scene of the crime. There was a chief of detectives named Jim Leggett who uh, hated the cameras and resisted them to the end. But uh, when uh, Albert Anastasia was uh, murdered in the barbershop over here on the west side, and I was there trying to get him to say something, he turned his back and was talking to the newspaper reporters, and I tried desperately to get him to turn around by asking some brilliant question. So I said, Chief, have any, any idea of a motive yet? And without turning around to face the camera, he said, yeah, somebody didn't like him. And then I said, uh, well, uh, Chief, uh, uh, do you have any clues? Yeah, we got a dead body. But they asked you about the Anastasia case. Underworld figure Meyer Lansky was a prime suspect in the Anastasia case. And I remember um, Meyer Lansky, the great, uh, well, you know, he's been immortalized in, in films. But he would come to New York every now and then, and of course, prosecutors were eager to talk to him. And I ran into him, well, I was following, I guess, some public uh, proceeding he had to be at. Uh, I say, Mr. Lansky, can you tell us anything about this? No, I, I ain't got no comment. But I watch your show whenever I'm in New York. You do a good job, kid. Are you suggesting to me that I have been part and parcel of something that, 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 is, that, that goes to what, what you're implying? I really don't know, Mr. Okay. DeMato. And I am telling you that I haven't I'm just a humble been. philosopher searching no, for the not. truth. You're doing a hatchet job. I'm not doing a hatchet job. Absolutely... No politician was immune from Gabe's probing questions. I need a lawyer when I talk to you, Gabe. <laughs> Gabe, how are you? Okay, Mr. Mondale, Gabe Preston here. Oh, I recognize you. <laughs> this is an expanded edition of News Forum with the Democratic presidential candidates. Oh, yeah. Are you still optimistic? I sure am. We're going to win. Go. Gabe, I won that debate. I don't care what the Monday morning quarterbacks say, and I base it on the polls. The mayors he's covered include Robert Wagner. As far as I'm concerned, Gabe, it isn't any stop uh, Kennedy movement at all. John Lindsay. Well, I think what I had to say last night, Gabe, speaks for itself. Ed Koch, David Dinkins, and Rudy Giuliani. Governor, I understand that uh, you said this morning to the North Carolina delegates that you'd be in this to the last man. Governors he's covered include Avril Harriman, Nelson Rockefeller, Hugh Carey, Mario Cuomo, and George Pataki. Many leading members of the Democratic and the Liberal Party here in the state of New York have talked to me about being a candidate for the United States Senate. Gabe covered Senators Robert Kennedy, Jacob Javits, and James Buckley. I'm the only person who can work with the Nixon administration constructively. Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan broke the news to Gabe first that he would not seek re-election. How do you feel about, about running again yourself, or haven't you made up your mind? Uh, Gabe, uh, Liz made up our mind four years ago. I am not running for re-election. He does have the contacts, he does have the history, he can get Daniel Patrick Moynihan to tell him, I'm not running again. Um, and in fact, Moynihan wanted to give that to him because of his history with Gabe, because Gabe had worked with him since the Harriman days. Politicians have disagreed with Gabe, some have gotten angry, and to some he's been a thorn in their side. The Times went out of its way to do that, to be fair. So in reporting on it, I expect, Gabe, that you're going to do the same thing and you're going to go out of your way to make it clear. We always do that. I mean, sometimes as the mayor, I don't enjoy his style, but as a, as a viewer, I would uh, very, very often enjoy watching him covering my predecessors. I can't think of an instance when I was mayor where Gabe ran a story that I thought was unfairly done. Gabe Pressman had uh, no agenda to destroy you or to make you look good. His agenda was simply the people's agenda. All I want is the facts. Too much democracy is a dangerous thing? That's about the most simplistic conclusion I've ever heard. There are times in which I get frustrated. I mean, sometimes I think he's being fair to me. Sometimes I think he's being unfair. Sometimes I think he's waiting one side or another. But when you take an overall view of it, I think Gabe is doing his job. He does it as a professional, and he does it with a lot of style. And you can respect him for that. There are times, however, when Gabe, like Rodney Dangerfield, can't seem to get any respect. All right, all right, Gen gentlemen, gentlemen, this is getting out of hand. You both are, you're in the House, you're in the Senate, there are rules, there's a presiding officer. I am in charge here, temporarily, you know, in your lives. And l l let's get back to these things in order. His debates have been classics. They're not the formal style, with time statements and rebuttals. 
It's all free flow, and he is seen as a fair moderator who's able to control the flow. How do you justify Hillary Clinton talking about an unsubstantiated allegation that the President of the United States had a mistress? Weren't you invading Mr. Bush's zone of privacy? Well, she was asked about it, and, and I think she's made her statement. I don't think she should have responded. I have always said that if it wasn't for Gabe Pressman, a lot of stories in this city that I both agree with or disagree with would have never been aired. If there was ever a big issue going down politically, Gabe Pressman was covering it, and you knew if you had him there that you were getting serious, that people were taking you seriously. Happy birthday, Gabe. You are a great New York institution. Just keep going strong. Happy birthday, buddy. Gabe, have a very happy birthday. Happy birthday, Gabe, because you're one person in every community of the city we love and respect. Gabe, 75 years old. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Gabe. You're the best. We love you, and you really represent New York. How do you keep the color in your hair? And how do you continue to look so young? Happy birthday, Gabe. Gabe Pressman is a tough journalist, but he found himself in another role that proved to be tougher, the role of husband and father. Mark Pressman, his first son, was born in 1956. Like most boys, Mark enjoyed swimming and building model airplanes. He also developed an interest in music. Liz was born two years after Mark. She loved English and drama. Then came Meg. A born teacher, she started her own play school at age eight and began a business babysitting in the summer. But Gabe was torn between his family and his passion for covering the news. And the news often won out. You'd always be listening to the scanner. And if uh, something happened, if there was a fire or some kind of you know, police action, whatever that was interesting, he'd go tear off and take me along with him. We just understood that his work would always come first. He just was, he was married to his work, basically. And he's always, he's always absolutely loved, loved his work. Yet he loved his children and he was determined to do things with them. They describe him as a kid at heart, but found that growing up with Gabe Pressman as your father was often difficult. At times, they would resent his work and notoriety. He was very uh, concerned and loving and, and you know, caring and um, supportive, uh, except that he's been married to his work. Uh, if I uh, share any of those characteristics, is that sometimes I'll get too involved in what I'm doing to remember the rest of my personal life, and sometimes I think he was that way. I regret that I didn't give more attention to those kids, that I was so, even though I saw them frequently, I was not uh, sufficiently involved as a father. But he wasn't entirely uninvolved either. Gabe wanted them to know that family was extremely important, and he tried to give them a taste of other worlds. In 1971, he took them on a trip to Europe. My dad took the three of us to Europe for three weeks. I mean, can you imagine taking three teenage children to Europe? Gabe, Mark, Liz, and Meg taking in the pomp and majesty of London, Big Ben, the Royal Guards. In France, strolling along the left bank, visiting the Arc de Triomphe, the Eiffel Tower, picture taking and sightseeing. Then onto Israel and Jerusalem, walking through the old city, swimming in the Dead Sea, playing with cousins on the beaches of the Mediterranean at Haifa, feeding the pigeons in Venice, touring the ancient ruins of Italy. Three weeks creating a lifetime of memories. New York City's Columbus Day Parade is always a big celebration. The 1967 event found Gabe Pressman along the route as usual. But this year, like Columbus, Gabe would discover a new world. I was covering the Columbus Day Parade. I was from Norway and I had just uh, been in New York for two months. And uh, this very attractive young woman just off the boat practically from Norway was ogling Rockefeller and Lindsay at the reviewing stand. So I um, couldn't really get by easily the, bar the police barricade. Somehow I flirted my way through and got over to Fifth Avenue to the reviewing stand. My camera crew was so impressed they invited her and a friend of hers to lunch. And um, this NBC crew started talking to me and uh, 
and introduced me to Gabe, I had no idea who he was. Um, never heard of him. And as they were leaving, I said, boy, this is a very attractive woman. He said, you know, what's your name again? Said, Vera Olson. So I knocked on the glass of the car and I said, what's your name? And she said, Vera Olson. He said, where do you work? And I said, well, Gottes Larsen. So the next morning I was somewhere, I was covering a story and I went to the phone book. I looked up Larsen, couldn't find it. I, I cursed. I said, nah, I should have gotten her phone number. And he struggled for a long time to find me the next morning. And then about an hour later, it dawned on me, Gottes Larsen was the last name. It was a compound name. So I looked it up, and sure enough, I found her. But being the persistent reporter he is, he managed to find me. I called her, and we met, uh, had a drink or something. I don't remember the full details, but uh, it was uh, love at first sight, almost. And um, that's how it started. On April Fool's Day, 1972, Vera Olsen became Mrs. Gabe Pressman. These are home movies of their first visit to Norway to visit Vera's parents who lived in Moss near the Oslo Fjord. In 1984, at the age of 60, Gabe became a father once more. And with the arrival of Michael Pressman, the seven-day-a-week worker began learning to balance work and family. I've been much more involved in his schoolwork. Uh, much more involved in his daily life and now that he's 15 of course he's uh, uh, developing independence and great interests of his own friends he comes to like meetings with parents or whatever he comes to basketball games for example um, if I need help on homework he can give it to me when he gets back from work and he's just totally devoted as a father devoted compassionate focused with a magnificent sense of humor these are just some of the ways he's described by family and friends. He's about the most loyal and best friend anybody could ever want. Tenacious, persistent, and resolute are other words used to describe him. He is very hard-headed and stubborn. He's extremely hard-headed and stubborn, but that's how he can be who he is. He could never have achieved what he has without being that way. Anyone who achieves also has critics. Gabe Pressman is no exception. A writer named Dick Shep. Uh, wrote a piece for New York Magazine. So his peg was the 10 most overrated uh, people in New York. I was very flattered uh, to be ranked as one of the most overrated people in New York. I'd just gotten there, as a matter of fact. People like the Cardinal, Cardinal Cook, well-respected man, McGeorge Bundy of the Ford Foundation, the Gabe Pressman. Now, there is a name, a man well-deserved to be on this overrated list. Mr. Bush the former president and his wife Barbara had a party and they had a Christmas party which everyone got slightly looped and he got up on a chair and he toasted uh, the ten most overrated men in New York. Every once in a while you gotta relax in life. Go with the flow, not worry about protocol and we had good time. We had a great time. He's often asked about his hair. Is it real? Yes. Does he color it? No. Why does he wear those corduroy suits? Because he's allergic to wool. This is the man you see on your television screen. This is the man you see driving on the streets of New York. Like television's Detective Columbo, he appears to live in his car at times. The seats and dashboard are strewn with notebooks, scraps of paper, and other assorted odds and ends. Some will tell you he won't drive himself to an early grave, but he might drive you to one. Well, I think that uh, I do have a tendency to do a lot of things at once uh, in a car, and that probably uh, is a danger to the human race. Don't take his word. Hear from those who have ridden with him. Danger, 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 emergency, emergency. I will take cabs two blocks. I will walk through snow rather than drive with Gabe. He'll be on the phone. He's dialing like this and steering like that, and I'm in the other seat, you know, wondering if I'm going to get to see my kids that night. Uh, get him on that and maybe develop that angle. The speed limit may be 30. Gabe's driving 20, while everybody else around him is doing 40. He forgets he's driving. He's, first of all, I'm Gabe Pressman. I'm going to go wherever the hell I want, and he does. He also doesn't look at the road. Even if he tried, it would be difficult. He can barely see over the steering wheel. But while New York drivers are intolerant of others, for him, they make an exception. We pull up to a light, and the guy in the other car, you know, when you're driving in, look over to see who is that driver. They look over and go, it's Gabe Pressman. And it'd be like, not a problem. I'm heading south towards City Hall. 
Yo, Gabe, happy birthday. Happy 75th, Gabe. Do another 75 and keep sticking up for the little guys. You're the best. Happy birthday, Gabe. I've loved you for the past 50 years. Keep it up. Happy birthday, Gabe. 75 is great, and just have a great birthday. Congratulations. Gabe, gratulere med dagen. Have a wonderful, wonderful 75th. It's been many good years. In July of 1956, in murky fog, 60 miles off Nantucket Island, the bow of the Swedish-American liner Stockholm tore into the starboard side of the Andrea Doria. The crash would prove disastrous as seawater poured through the fatal gash. Within moments of impact, it was clear the Andrea Doria was doomed. The order to abandon ship was given, and calls rang out for help. Gabe Pressman's phone was also ringing. It was the middle of the night, and I was uh, asleep at home, and I got a call from Bill Curry, I think it was, on the assignment desk, and he said, uh, we've got this ship that's in trouble off Nantucket, and uh, apparently there's been a collision. As the scene was being played out in the Atlantic, Gabe rushed to Coast Guard headquarters, where he was chosen to fly out over the disaster to provide pooled coverage for everyone. Yeah, but I'm doing reports on radio every half hour here. I'd rather stay here. So he dragged me kicking and screaming onto that Coast Guard plane. And I took my tape recorder out, which was a very crude, heavy, old-fashioned tape recorder, and I began to talk about what I saw as the ship went down like a, like a toy in a bathtub. Now we can see, guys, there's a foam shooting up as the ship descends. This is a horrible sight, a horrible experience. See this once proud vessel, the pride of the Italian Richard Marine, sinking gradually into the depths of the Atlantic Ocean. In terms of a milestone in my journalistic career, uh, this was very significant. Milestone journalism would become the norm for Gabe Pressman. He covered all the big events and the big names with style, compassion, and energy. When Fidel Castro first came to New York, Gabe was there. I don't want that anybody be worried here. What about your personal Nothing philosophy? Nothing is I... going to happen. Nothing is going to happen here. He covered the icons that defined the 50s and 60s. I liked uh, Marilyn Monroe for her throaty, <sighs> kind of uh, not saying anything. He covered virtually every congressional, criminal, and cultural event of the past 40 years. Miss uh, the singing career very much, or are you enjoying this army life? I, I miss my singing career very much, uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, the, the army is a pretty good deal too. The whole situation was interesting. It was the first time, in my experience, I'd ever seen kids act like this, and I didn't understand the music. It took me years later. Jim Hartz explained the Beatles' music to me about 10 years later, and I really understood it. <laughs> At the time, I was too busy chasing fire engines and politicians to uh, get culture. Do you feel like Samson? If you lost your hair, you'd lose what you have? I it... don't know, I don't know. By 1965, the war in Vietnam was heating up, and so were the streets and campuses back home. A new generation was coming of age, protesting a war they didn't think was justified. And the term counterculture became a household word. Could we ever be much In the summer of 1969, there was a gathering at a little farm in upstate New York that began to attract young people from all over America. Thousands jammed the roads leading to a place called Woodstock. It was unbelievable to me see all these kids this was the the height of the 60s their passion for the music and for each other and it was a wet weekend and there was mud everywhere gabe pressman not only covered woodstock he appeared in the movie you're in the red oh the company oh the financially if you try to think on those terms when you're talking about something like this i had not realized that there was this great infrastructure of youth out there i wasn't that much older than they were. And uh, 
it was a revelation to me. I said, where have I been? Well, you know, this has been going on and I didn't know it. I was too busy covering City Hall. Ten years later, he was still discovering stories he hadn't been aware of. It was the 1980s and the Reagan revolution was underway. But the promise of prosperity hadn't reached some New Yorkers. Gabe's news director suggested there was a story. When he approached me, you know, with doing a series on the homeless, a series of stories, I said, you mean the bums on the Bowery? And I, you know, I'm biting my tongue now when I think that I said that. And he said, Gabe, get into it, and you'll see that it's not that simple. This is the East 3rd Street Shelter, hub of the city's program for homeless men. He understood it back in 1980. He understands it now that we're approaching the millennium. 20 years later, he still understands that human beings suffering, freezing to death on the streets is, is an outrage. And what we saw was shocking. And we also found that New Yorkers had a lot of compassion for the homeless. And what a place this is. It reeks of decay, of human excrement. There is filth. My dad has always crusaded for the underdog, and he's always crusaded for what's good and what's fair and what's ethical. There are fleas and lice, not enough counselors or social workers, paint peeling off walls, a sense of desolation and desperation. To have a gay pressman step up to the plate continually over that 20-year span and say, this is, this is an outrage, lends a credibility and makes the folks at home sit up and realize, yeah, I should care. Most of Gabe's colleagues will tell you that once he gets into a story, he just doesn't let go. Gabe became more intrigued with the homeless. He decided to probe deeper to find out just who these people were who were living on the streets. It's hard to imagine what it's like to be homeless and mentally ill in this city. The result was a special report. There is an asylum in the streets of New York City, a snake pit of horror and fear. It was the horror and fear of another group of people that brought Gabe to Jerusalem in the summer of 1981. They stream into Jerusalem. There are aging faces here, but you see more than the marks of time, for these are the survivors, the people who miraculously lived, even as their mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, children, aunts, uncles, cousins, were being killed by Hitler's SS. 6,000 people who escaped the Nazi executioners and their children stream into this city for the first and probably the last world gathering of Jewish Holocaust survivors. They have journeyed here to bear witness. Conflict is no stranger to Israel. For thousands of years, Jews and Arabs have fought one another over a land which has significance to three major religions. It's an ongoing story, and one that Gabe Pressman has reported on many times from both perspectives, at times placing his own life and his producers on the line. We just passed a sign that said, Welcome to Gaza, and a rock threw, went through the window of the van we were riding in. And, uh, it was welcome to Gaza and the Palestinian Rock Festival. In 1990, when Operation Desert Storm was underway, Gabe was in the thick of things as Saddam's scuds began unleashing their terror. News Force Gabe Pressman has been in Israel while each of these attacks were carried out. He begins our reports live now from Tel Aviv. Gabe? Yes, what Israelis dreaded might happen, uh, Chuck, has happened. Eight years later, he was on hand as the nation of Israel celebrated its 50th anniversary. Military units marched smartly just before Vice President Al Gore and his wife Tipper, to warm applause, entered the stadium in Jerusalem tonight. A ceremony climaxing Israel's 50th anniversary. This after a day when Israeli jets roared overhead, Navy ships passed in review. Heavy security, Palestinian areas shut off. The Arabs weren't celebrating. Gabe has never let his Jewish heritage interfere with his objectivity. With equal compassion for both sides, he sought out the stories of the people who are a microcosm of an age-old conflict. 
Ali Abed Jaber says Israel's triumph was his tragedy, that he was driven out of his home in 1948 by soldiers of the young Jewish nation. For the last 50 years, Abed Jaber has lived in or near a refugee camp a few miles from Jerusalem on the West Bank. He wanted to show us where he once lived, so we drove him to Jerusalem. An Israeli youngster watched, curious. When more gathered, Abed Jaber asked them how could they believe this was their land. They replied, everybody knows that. Abed Jaber replies, I wish to God everyone who told you it was your land was dead. Angered, the boy says, I wish you were dead. As they run away, they shout, it's our land. We will never give it back. Go away. One land, two peoples, in a struggle that never seems to end. In Jerusalem, Gay Pressman, News Channel 4. The conflict between black and white back home also got his attention. The 1964 murders of James Cheney, Michael Schwerner, and Andrew Goodman, three civil rights workers slain in Philadelphia, Mississippi, prompted a trip to the South in 1989. We followed a pilgrimage back by some of the families involved in that, those slayings, and take a look at Mississippi and see what's happened after 25 years, which had some but not enough changes in terms of race relations. The result was this special report. It was a crime that would shock the country and leave the bloody stain of racial violence on a tiny town in Mississippi. Two young men from the New York area would join a local black man on a ride that began with a search for justice and ended with their murders. 25 years later, their three families reassembled in the town of Philadelphia, Mississippi, leading a pilgrimage in search of hope and racial harmony in a place once ruled by hate. Hate knows no geographic boundaries. Back home, Gabe found that even at a time when New Yorkers were enjoying historically low crime rates, there were an increasing number of complaints involving brutality on the part of those sworn to protect and uphold the law. Abner Louima, a church-going man, finds it hard to forgive the officers who allegedly brutalized him. He wants his assailants punished. He says he was beaten up at the 70th Precinct Station House. Did you swing at the cops outside the nightclub, as they say you did? Never did in my life. you punch them? I don't punch nobody. Police Commissioner Safer characterized the crime. I don't consider this an act of police brutality. I consider this a criminal act. The mayor said a major problem was the silence of police officers who may have seen what happened and weren't talking. It's usually the things people don't want to talk about that intrigue Gabe like the increases in cancer victims despite the supposedly all-out effort to eradicate the dreaded disease. A controversy rages in the world of medicine of which many Americans are not aware. Responsible critics question whether the major weapons used in the war on cancer, surgery, radiation, and most of all, chemotherapy, are doing the job. Doing his job means digging for facts, reporting what he finds, and telling the story. It means questioning the conventional, driven at all times by the people's right to know and the First Amendment. Happy birthday, Gabela. Gabe, happy birthday, buddy. Happy birthday, Gabe, and many, many more. You're a great guy. Happy birthday, Gabe. From the heart of New York City, this is Gabe Pressman reporting. Through the eyes of an NBC camera and this reporter, we're ready to move through the year 1958, which, like any year, became a series of beats in what I feel is today's most exciting form of journalism. To see, to listen, to dig for facts, to record human emotions, to narrate the continuing story of New York, that is my function. 41 years later, Gabe Pressman still sees it as his function. Journalists excel when they report stories with passion, enthusiasm, and accuracy, because the audience trusts them. Gabe Pressman is credibility, and that's what he gives to our television station by his presence on our newscast. I think the, the deepest motivating thing about Gabe is his profound belief in democracy, and he 
feels that he is, in a way, the guardian of the power people have invested in public officials. He's been on guard duty for half a century now, looking out for the interests of his fellow citizens. And it's wonderful, even when you're involved in disputes with Gabe, it's wonderful to see that. I mean, it, it, because it very much represents the voice of the citizen. Gabe Pressman figured the New York City school chancellor had some explaining to do about the shoddy workmanship and damages shortly after this brand new school opened in Harlem. The story ran in November of 1996. It's a mess. A buckled gymnasium floor. A parent showed the damage to our crew with a hidden camera. Throughout this school, severe water damage. In the basement, leaking boilers. PS4 in Washington Heights, which cost about $20 million, opened its doors just last year. The school was supposed to be a beacon in a poverty-stricken neighborhood, and now parents say it's an outrage. We caught up with school's chancellor, Rudy Crew, and tried to ask him how this happened. Crew did some broken field dodging. The gymnasium floor is buckled, and all, all the construction... I'd be more happy to have somebody give you a call about it. Okay. Yeah, but do you know about it? his media specialist acting as blocking back. I am from Boston. Yeah, yeah you're from Boston, but mm -hmm. you don't understand New York. We have a quaint custom here. We have a quaint custom here. We, we talk to our officials when they appear in public. Thank you and very much. And you don't understand Clearly, the chancellor did not want to talk about it, so the question remains, who goofed? Gay Pressman, News Channel 4. Some of us think that if we charge up to someone and make an accusation, and get an emotional, angry response that that's what we should be doing. That's not what Gabe does. Um, Gabe does a lot of research, and Gabe goes in with lots of information. Officials trying to keep public information private cuts at the heart of what Gabe holds dearest, the public's right to know and the press's freedom to report it. New York Daily News attorney Eve Burton recalls the time a judge tried to keep Gabe and his camera out of a courtroom. And he proceeded down the hallway as this person is saying, no, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, you're, you're really not supposed to be. You, you know what? I'm the press. I'm allowed to be here. This is our First Amendment rights. And he walked through the quarters of the hall, blew into the courtroom, and he said, okay. And I don't remember the name of the cameraman. He said, let's roll. The judge was so surprised, he turned and he said, well, let's at least just turn off the sound. A journalist must be strong and strong-willed. It's not a profession for wallflowers. As this 1964 footage shows, Gabe is not a wallflower. The ambassador told me he would talk to me now. I've never seen anybody as uh, aggressive and persistent in, in pressing a point of uh, getting an answer. While Gabe fights for the rights of citizens, he often finds himself engaged with his own colleagues in the newsroom. Do I have hassles with him all the time? You know, that's part of the creative uh, process, yeah, I guess. Uh, but we both respect each other. Gabe was a very critical editor. He never quite predicted that I wouldn't go anyplace in this business, but he did say, don't you know how to write? You write for the ear, you don't write for the page. And actually, he was a very good teacher. We're always fighting to the death for a point. It was like, he was the content king, and I was the production queen. And I had to have pacing and graphics and quick sound bites. Oh. TV news suffers from this propensity for sound bites. I think content is what they need, context and content. And you can't have content in 15 seconds. The great thing that we have, we can capture, is human personality. Questions and answers, not just answers, not just 15 second answers. And people are a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for. He's anxious to, to clarify the details of that story for his audience. He's thinking of the audience. He's thinking of his responsibility. Never consciously, I'm sure. But subconsciously, he has that journalist goal of getting this story to the people and, and doing whatever it takes to get it. He was one of the people, or the main person, that gave me an interest in news and had me watching, and as a result, uh, led to me trying to be in this business. Barry Goldwater, who battled to change his party's ideology at a time when Eastern moderate Republicans were in control. I have, I have fond memories of Gabe. During our political coverage, covering conventions, um, we used to go on the road wherever the convention was and cover them, and I'd always have Gabe Pressman or Ralph Penza with me. And the competitive juices never diminished year after year between those two guys. There was a tendency in that time, clear back to Mayor Wagner's days and through Mayor Lindsay, Mayor Beam, for them to begin their responses with, 
Well, Gabe. Well, uh, uh, Gabe. There were posters all around the newsroom where I worked, the competitive newsroom where I worked, that showed the Pope waving, getting off a plane. And under it was a caption that said, what do we do if the Pope gets off the plane and says, well, Gabe. <laughs> Gabe Pressman could line up his journalism awards along an entire city block if he had any interest in doing so. But his ethics, his energy, his intelligence, and his dedication stretch much farther. By virtue of him associating himself with the story, when it comes on our air, you're going to turn and pay attention. Why? Because it must be a story or Gabe Pressman wouldn't be doing it. When you see Gabe and, and when you experience Gabe, and you, you know that you're looking at and seeing a part of New York? He is New York. Gabe Pressman, happy birthday. A New York City living landmark. Happy birthday, Gabe. Happy, happy birthday. And remember, it's Gornish Telfin, so it's all Nishka Falak. Happy birthday, Gabe. You don't look a day over 76. Happy 75th birthday. You're loved by so many people you will never know. Happy birthday, Gabe, uh, for your 75th. And don't come after me and ask why I'm not telling you that. From the platonic bottom of my heart, Gabe, I love you and happy birthday. God bless you, happy birthday, and many more. I want to wish you a uh, happy 75th birthday, and I'd like to wish you 75 more, but I'll stick with 45 more. Happy birthday, Gabe. Pressman. Do solemnly pledge. Do solemnly pledge. June 1st, 1998. Gabe Pressman being inducted for his second term as president of the New York Press Club. So what do you do and where do you go after your 75th birthday and you've been covering news in New York City for half a century? If you're Gabe Pressman, the answer is simple. You go to work. Some folks would have retired 10 years ago. I think I won't hang up my spikes uh, until I absolutely physically can't continue. I'll, I'll be doing some kind of journalism. For the consummate newsman, there's fertile ground to be plowed. And in an age when he has concerns about the direction journalism seems to be heading, he feels it important to impart his standards to the next generation. And besides, the man has a lifetime contract, so odds are you won't be seeing him stop anytime soon. You know, we say in, in TV journalism that uh, when you talk to the camera and you explain what the story is or you reach your conclusion of the story, that's called a stand-upper. So my last stand-upper might be a lie-downer. You've seen him all over the world reporting on all kinds of topics. But the following observation from 1958 probably sums up the man best. And there it is, a portrait of New York and the events of a year. The biggest, brashest, saddest, and in some ways the cruelest and yet the most exciting city of them all. As a reporter, I become part of it. Like a magnet, it attracts, and my beat extends over an area of 500 square miles, sometimes making one feel like a breathless runner in a race. But don't get me wrong, I love New York, and thanks for riding along. This has been an NBC4 special presentation to Gabe Pressman for A Life in the News. Many happy returns. <laughs>